I had a woman uh, come. I got this session on videotape. This woman, she she smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 50 years. Mm. And I said, what are your best hopes from talking to me? And after a little bit of back and forth, she said, I want to become a non-smoker today. Mm. <laughs> and every time I show this clip, I, I play the video and I pause it and people are like, man, that's hard. No, it's not. All she, in order to become a non-smoker today, all she has to do is not smoke today. Today, that's, that's a it. <laughs> and my, my dad actually did that. My dad stopped smoking and drinking the same day he's been sober for 39 years. Right. So yeah. think about that for a moment. I actually make it harder for her to stop smoking if I tell her how hard it is. Right. If I simply say, what are you going to do instead of smoking? Which is what I said to this woman. She said, I want to become a non-smoker today. I said, and when, you, when you stop smoking, what are you going to do instead? I'm going to rob people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she just picks up another vice. <laughs> At least she ain't smoking. I know, right? I'm breaking in the car. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, well. <laughs> I don't remember what she said now. You know, oh, my bad, my bad. <laughs> but yeah. she said something not, I will rob people. <laughs> um, she said she wanted to have control over her life. Mm. And I said, when was the last time you remember having control? She said, when I was like five, seven years old. This woman is 75. And I said, if you woke up tomorrow with the control you had at five or seven, but you have it at 75, what would you do? She said, I would dance. Mm. Right? She said, I would dance. But all we're doing is having a conversation about what planet she wants to go live on. And we get so stuck on how hard it is to get to the planet. We talk to the client about how hard it is, not realizing we are telling them I doubt you. And sometimes you just need somebody in your corner to believe that you can do the unimaginable thing. Yeah. Like being in Florida with this ridiculous idea, like I'm gonna go to LA and make movies. Mm. How many people, I, I don't know how many restaurants, Anna, how many restaurants we've been to out here in LA? Like 10,000 restaurants? <laughs> Every time you talk to a server, they are too handsome or too good looking. Like, what are you doing in LA? I'm trying to be, get into acting. This dude got into acting before he got out here. Yeah. With movie credits came and allowed him to get into agent. Like, why can't we just view people as capable, full stop? Yeah. Mm. Like, that's it, just full stop. Yeah. So when his 10-year-old daughter says, I want to be an astronaut, we have no idea how this story's going to end, but he's just choosing to view her as capable. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, I'm just talking to her like she could become an astronaut. Right. Right? If he were to say, oh, you can't do that, you're not good enough in math, You've literally just squished this young child's dream. And the scary thing about that, I want y'all all to hear this because it's relevant for therapists. When I squish one dream, I stop you from being a dreamer. You, you don't like, oh, okay, I can't be an astronaut. I'm gonna dream about becoming a star in the WNBA or I'm gonna dream, it doesn't work that way. If my dad tells me, I don't think you can do that, you view yourself as less capable. And as a therapist, when your client says, I wanna get sober, and we say, well, you know, heroin's real hard. They, <laughs> I, I know, I'm on it. <laughs> I've never touched stuff. I've been doing it for 30 years. <laughs> but, when, but when our clients say that stuff, and they do, they say things like, like um, a better oh. example. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. <laughs> Is clients will say all the time, like, I need to stop drinking. I just got two DUIs, and my attorney said I need to come to therapy because I got my third DUI, and the judge is going to take my license if I don't come to therapy. So I'm in therapy, and, and I'm, I, I want to quit drinking. And I've seen therapists say to that client, uh, how long have you been drinking? And, the, the, you know, since high school, 30 years. Have you ever tried to quit before? What makes this any different? I'm like, you just told the person you, that he can't quit. And, and we think we're just preparing him for how hard it's going to be. No, you got to ask him. I've got another therapy session uh, with a guy who's using crystal methamphetamine. And here's the thing we need to remember about our clients. Like that client has to go out into the world and say no. It doesn't matter how good of a therapist I am or I'm not. He's going to go meet a drug dealer and he's going to have to turn that drug dealer down. So my job is to help him be the version of himself in that moment that will help him do that. So I said, what do you want to achieve? He said he wanted to be a better dad and he wanted to be a mechanic. And then I know, like if I can have you show up at that next encounter with a drug dealer as the father in you and the mechanic in you, you're more likely to say no. Right. 
So I got to talk to him, like, as you walk through this world as a father mechanic, what would you know? Like, just help him get to know that version of him. That dude didn't touch crystal methamphetamine again. Mm. And, and people are like, wow, that seemed quick. No, it's, it's not quick when you understand how you activate someone's internal greatness is exactly what Justin is talking about. It's how he views himself, oddly, because most people don't view themselves that way. Mm. And it's how he viewed his daughter. When his daughter said something that actually is a bit crazy, like, Dad, I want to be an astronaut. You know how many people have walked on the moon? Like 10. (laughs) It ain't a lot of people. Fewer have walked on Mars. So she's saying something that is highly unlikely to occur. But how does he know that she's not the 11th one who's going to do it? Like, so I might as well treat her like she's capable. And the beautiful thing about that is there's really only two outcomes that will happen. Either she's going to be the next person to walk on Mars or she's going to learn really incredible lessons as she pursues it. Mm -hmm. So it's not really even relevant if she walks on Mars or not. What's relevant is he has turned her into a dreamer. Now, somewhere between 10 and 18, the dream may change. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But you've turned her into a dreamer, and that's the point. Yep. Right? we got to have our clients be dreamers because for some people, happiness when you've been abused is a dream. Like for some people, like not using drugs when I come from, like I come from, uh, I was born on the west side of Chicago. When I met Adam, he lived in Chicago. So we went to Chicago, we were probably like 10 years into our friendship the first time we went to Chicago. Like it was a long time before we went together. It was during COVID. COVID. So we go to Chicago and Adam's like, I wanna go by and visit my my home where where I live. And I'm like, all right, man, that's cool. We put some address in (laughs) Wayne's. It's, it, it, his defense is pretty accurate. <laughs> He's like, why'd you get all stiff, man? Uh, I don't know, you're doing a pretty uh, Thank you. uh, Thank accurate you. observation? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so we, we put the address in waves, in waves, and we're driving out to this place called Downers Grove, and I'm looking around, and I see this white dude mowing his lawn, with a Chicago Cubs hat, and he was walking like, (laughs) as he's mowing his lawn. (laughs) And I was like, Adam, and this is literally what I said to him. I turned to Adam and I said, this ain't my Chicago. Because my Chicago is Lake Street. Like my Chicago, well, well, Lake Lake Street has changed. But we go visit my family, and Adam's daughter, Adam has his young daughter, she was like 10 at the time. And we drive, we get off the exit of my Chicago, and, and Adam's daughter turns to him and he goes, How come there's so much litter around? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, because we don't care, and he threw a fork out. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, no! Yeah. And yeah. I had to say to my daughter, We do care, and he was not supposed to throw that fork out. Oh, uh, no. But, <laughs> now see, that was karma. That's what you get. <laughs> I said, you, you were talking mess about the stiffness, and then he had something. He had an ace in the. That might still be true, but he's still stiff. <laughs> <laughs> that might be true, but he's still stiff. But like, <laughs> my bad. I'm gonna shut the hell up. I don't, remember, I don't remember my point now. I'm messing my with bad. Justin. My bad. Um, but some people, thank you. Some people come from the west side of Chicago and they don't have resources. And I can remember when I was a kid, I left Chicago. Yeah, I left, I left Chicago when I was four. And when I saw cars and balloons and evidence of a party at four, it meant somebody was coming home from prison. So when I moved to Boston and I saw cars and balloons, I was like, oh, who's coming home? Like, it's my birthday, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but imagine being on the west side of Chicago and having the audacity to say something like, I want to be an astronaut. Like, people look at you like you're crazy. When I was growing up in Boston, I told people I want to go to college. And they were like, for what? Like, I just want to go to college. I just, the, my honest answer, the reason I wanted to go to college was somebody told me something I thought was unbelievable because I didn't come from an environment where everybody went to college. Somebody told me that colleges have dorm rooms. And I was like, what's a dorm room? And like, oh, it's a big old building where all the students stay. And I was like, any parents in there? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, for real? I was like, any, any parents in there? 
And they were like, no, no parents. My father was so abusive, I, that was my escape. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I gotta get into a, a dorm room. Cause that was the first place I could ever think I could live without an abuser being in the house with me. So I'm like, I wanna go to college. And all these friends were like, you ain't college material. I wasn't until I found out there were no parents in the dorm room, <laughs> right? But like, that's the whole entire point is we have to talk to our clients as if they can dream. And then they're much more likely to pursue those dreams because it just takes one person. This young 10 year old, she's gonna go to school and tell the teacher, I wanna be an astronaut. And the teacher gonna be like, oh, you should be a nurse. And you know what she's gonna do? She's gonna, uh-uh, you wrong, because my dad told me I could do it. Mm -hmm. Like that's a powerful message. Because she, because Justin said that, doesn't mean the naysayers now, oh, you, you right, he was right, you're gonna be an astronaut. They're not gonna do that. The naysayers are still gonna line up, but she now has data to confront that, right? She now has data that says, wait, you said I wouldn't, but that guy says I could, and I'm gonna choose him, because it feels good when he says it. Mm -hmm. I, I now know not to listen to people who disbelieve mm -hmm. in my truth. And think about that from the client's journey, because if I'm a drinker, how many times do you think I called my best friend and said, look, man, I can't do this no more. And then two weeks later, we had happy hour together. So then I call that best friend like, man, I'm quitting. Man, you ain't gonna quit. I mean, I haven't had a drink since I was in college. The last night I had a drink, uh, I got super duper drunk at a fraternity event. I woke up in my bed on my back and my watch was on my chest. I had no earthly idea how I got back to my dorm room or how this watch got on my chest. I turned and looked at my roommate. I said, hey, man, uh, what happened? And he said, what happened? Go look outside. Now, the, the window from my dorm room, I could see the parking lot. There were all these puddles of vomit. And he, and he said, that's oh. you. Mm -mm. <laughs> so that was you. Mm -hmm. And I, I never drank again, for real. I never drank again. But when I told people, like, I'm not drinking anymore, they were like, you'll be drinking next week. You'll be drinking, but that's what people do. When you talk to them about their dreams, that's what they do. But not his daughter, because he has told her, it's okay to dream, I believe in your dreams. I'm gonna spend resources. I'm gonna go buy you books about astronauts. I'm gonna do things to make, and she's gonna accept that. Like, oh, that guy thinks I'm right. So when somebody comes around and says he, she's wrong, she has contrary information that is easier for her and more pleasant for her to believe in. You gotta be that for your clients.